Melbourne, Matthew and I are from Melbourne, Australia, and we have the privilege of leading a beautiful group of people called Melbourne Lights Church with an amazing team around us. We've got two boys, Hugo is 10 and Henry is 6, and we've been leading the church for about 12 years. A couple of years ago, we got to bring our children with us to Peter Maritzburg, and they got to experience One Life Church and the amazing part of the world that you live in. And so it's such an honour after being with you to be able to share with you all today. Um, so I'd love to start by opening in prayer. Jesus, we just thank you that no matter where we are, that you are able to be here with us. Would you just presence yourself with us today? Would your Holy Spirit just work in our hearts? Would you change us today, Jesus? Thank you, Lord, that none of us will be the same. Thank you that you are a powerful God who can do mighty things in our beautiful hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So I'm a lady who loves to shop. Some of you may be able to commiserate with me of what a challenging thing that can be to have. Um, but I think one of the reasons that I really love to shop is that I love choices. I love having lots of things to choose from. I love going away and taking like four pairs of shoes because one pair isn't enough because, you know, shoes can make or break an outfit. I like to have different options for earrings. There are like earrings in little compartments in my car because I need to have choices um, and what I wear can have an impact on how my day is um, so you know it's it's a big decision but a couple of years ago my husband and I began the process of building a house for our family and what I quickly discovered was that as much as I loved making choices making choices for a house and what it's going to look like when you're going to live in it for a long time and you want it to last a long time, um, what had a lot more impact and took a lot more careful consideration and thinking through than maybe what earrings I wore. Um, and the choices that I made were going to affect how my house was going to look and function into the future. If you have your Bibles, could you open them with me to Joshua 24 verse 14. So it says, I'll give you a second. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is making a speech to the Israelites. The Israelites had been enslaved for many, many years in Egypt. Um, but even when they're enslaved, they knew where their food was coming from. They knew where they would sleep at night. Even in that time, there was a comfort and a, a knowing that everything would be all right. And then a guy called Moses comes and says, God's going to deliver you from this and take you into the promised land. God rescues them from that. He does mighty, amazing things. And then they journey through the desert for 40 years before they reach the promised land. And then once they reach the promised land, it isn't just they're ready for them to start living in. They then spend around 30 to 40 years in battle against the people that are already living there before it's theirs. So Joshua makes this speech after he has led them into the land and through the battles. And he's just divided up the land for the different tribes and he lets them know that you can serve whichever God you like. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Um, this time together has been given the beautiful theme chosen. What a beautiful word and what a powerful revelation that we have been chosen. These Israelites were chosen. They were God's chosen people. And yet here they are, standing, having to make a decision, a choice for themselves that will affect the generations to come. So my question today is, what will you choose? We all make choices every day. Some smaller ones, like what earrings I'm going to wear or what shoes I'm going to wear, to some huge, significant and life-changing decisions. In our lives, we make the eternity-changing decision to follow Jesus and where he leads us. But there is this amazing and exciting moment that happens in that of a dream to dream about a different life. 
for us it was a bit like the dream we'd always had to build a house and the Israelites, the dream of being freed from slavery. Often the life though that we step into and the dream that we had gets uncomfortable. We've left what we've known and what we knew to be comfortable in behind as we journey in what God has ahead for us. And we can look back at what we did have. When we started to build the journey, when we started the journey to build our own home, we moved out of a comfortable place, a place that we knew and into a smaller place, but our everyday lives went on. It, this happens when we choose to follow Jesus. We move out of what we did do into a different place, but our lives go on. Our kids went to school, we went to work, I still had to clean and cook and clean and cook and we had connect groups in our tiny little apartment that we lived in, leaders meetings in our house. It was an uncomfortable time and it was a time where little niggles could get on top of you. We'd left our old home in pursuit of a new one and the current one was not as comfortable as the old one. So how do we keep moving forward when it gets uncomfortable? How do we make a stand for us and our households to serve the Lord and to keep serving the Lord when it's uncomfortable? My first thing that I wanted to say is identify what you're saying no to when you say yes to God. Joshua said in chapter 24 and verse 14, the bit we started with, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. What choice is this for you? What do you still need to put aside? What are the things that come up that you still need victory over? Sometimes we need other people to stand in prayer with us and there's some things we just need to choose to put aside and say no to. Because if we don't make that stand, they'll keep coming at us. So what things are we putting before God? That's what we say no to when we say yes to God. Um, a really simple example of this in our family is that as soon as I had children, Saturday nights were the night that they wouldn't sleep. And Sunday nights, even, Sunday mornings, even now, are the one morning when they never ever sleep in that they'll sleep in. But I had to make the stand when they were young that no matter what my Saturday night was like, as for me and my house, we were going to serve the Lord on a Sunday morning together. No matter how tired I am or how my kids are, we're going to serve the Lord because He is bigger than my tiredness. And I want them to grow up knowing that when tough stuff happens and when life's uncomfortable, church, community is where you should be, not what you should take a break from. When I say yes to that, my kids also say, see me saying no to other things and their values are shaped. It's the same with prayer meetings, connect groups, getting together with other believers and encouraging one another, reaching out, whatever it is that like is trying to be distracted away from, um, is saying yes to those things and no to other things. So one week while we were building our house, we got a call from our cabinet maker and that's the man who makes the kitchen. And he was a bit concerned about how the cupboard handles were going to work in our house because you know, if they didn't fit right, then it wouldn't function right. And it seems like such a small decision, a little bit like a Sunday morning getting up. But those cupboard handles are in nearly every room of my house. And the decision that we made to on that handle affected what our house looks like and how it functions now and in years to come. It seems like such a small decision, but it has an ongoing impact. What seemingly small choices do we make daily that will affect what our house, what our life, what our family looks like in years to come? In Australia, a cultural thing is that kids' sport is all on a Sunday. So our son loves soccer, but if we choose for him to play sport on a Sunday morning instead of coming to church, although we may think it's only a few months of the year, they're only young, it's not a big deal, but that small decision has an impact on what my family is going to look like and what they're going to value in the future. It will impact how he makes decisions and how important it is to him to be involved in church community. So what do I want my house to look like? I want my kids to value this, so I need to say yes to this. And that involves saying no to other things. The second thing is I have to take practical steps to make it happen. So by nature, I am a late and 
disorganised person. Um, I always think I can just fit a few more things into my morning or my handbag or another pair of earrings into my car that I can fit into a compartment. But because I know that that is who I am, I need to plan better for my family to serve the Lord. I need to prioritise my life and make choices so that the things of God take place before anything else. That also means keeping space or keeping a margin. When I was a kid at school, we would rule up our page and leave margins. And that's where the teachers would have space to write corrections or notes to help us change things in our lives. Um, when building a house, there are so many things that you can add to. That's a good thing and that's a good thing. And they're all good things. But if I was to add every good thing into our house, we would have no space to move and we would have no money. And if I had have added maybe that good thing, then that cost me money, which later on the track, down the track, I needed for other things that were much more significant, but I hadn't foreseen. So what does that look like in the kingdom of God in my life? If someone needs to be me to be there for them, have I allowed space in my life and margin for that? Or am I so busy and emotionally full that I don't have space for the people and the things that happen along the way? All through the Gospels, Jesus left room in his life and his schedule for the interruptions from others and from those needing his help. And that is how he shared the Gospel. What steps do you, do I need to take in order to have a life that is choosing to serve the Lord and choosing to have space to share him with others? My third point is to remember God uses the process. In Australia, it's a long process to build a house. We had a few friends from South Africa visit while we were building our house and were shocked with how long it takes. For us, it was three years. So the process here is a long time. But we were able to use that time to research things we wanted and to save for extra things or to cut things out and to edit things, add things, take things away. During that waiting time, things were happening. The foundations were being laid and if we didn't wait for them to set, then the next part wouldn't work right. And the structural integrity of our house wouldn't have been able to carry what it needed to in the future. And all of those parts were an important part of the process. When the Israelites were in the desert, God did lots in their hearts, preparing them and teaching them his ways for what lay ahead. He does that so much in our lives too, and we start to grumble about the process. But if it wasn't for the process, we'd never be the house that is serving the Lord. We'd never walk fully in what he is calling us to do in serving him and living for him fully. What are we choosing to enjoy the process and make the most of the process or are we grumbling about the process as it happens? Romans 8 verse 28 says, I'll flick there. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. We have been called according to his purpose and he's working all the things in our life for his purpose, not for ours, for his purpose. Let's remember that one. Number four, remember the faithfulness of God. One of the things I love about Joshua is that when they first got near the promised land, they sent 12 spies in. 10 of them were like, wow, it's full of giants. It's just like full on. In Numbers 14, they say, why does the Lord bring us to the land in order to kill us by the sword and our wives and our little ones will be its prey? Isn't it better for us to go back to Egypt? But Joshua and Caleb were the ones that remembered the faithfulness of God and viewed the land through the lens that when they came back, they said, the land is flowing with milk and honey. There are giants, but God will be faithful to what he has promised. Remind yourself of what he has promised. Get around people who help you remember what he promised. That's one of the reasons that God calls us to be together and added in community. The Israelites often forgot and went back to their old ways of life and started to burr off the track of the call of God. But at different times in their story, God had people who reminded them of his faithfulness and what he called them to. So put people in your life. Number five, keep your eyes fixed on the prize. 
Every day while we were building our home, I would drive past it. I'm sure the people building it thought that I was a little bit creepy. Um, but going past it every day reminded me of what the sacrifices were for, reminded me of why every decision was an important thing for what lay ahead. It made it feel so real. I'd get out and I'd walk around and I'd start planting things and planting plants. If I didn't keep my eyes fixed on the end result, then the continual decisions, the running here and there, the restrictions of our current living space would make it seem like such a sacrifice. I heard someone very wise once say, if the prize is, dis dis if the prize is diminished, the sacrifice seems great, but if the prize is magnified, the sacrifice seems small. This isn't just for me and my eternity, but it's for the generations to come and their eternity. It's for their purpose and their destiny in following Jesus. And sometimes the sacrifices I make affect their future more than it affects mine. Some of you today may be a little bit like Lot's wife, where God's called you away from something and told you not to look back. But she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. Where you look is where you live. If your eyes are fixed on the past, then that's where you're living and you have no future there. Put your eyes on what lay ahead, on what God has already planned out for you, not on what is now, but on what will be. We have a choice to make between two paths, the choice each day to serve the Lord, to each day step into the path to Jesus. It doesn't look easy. Often the other path looks much more appealing and much easy, easier. It may not be an easy process. The process may be hard, but a prize that lays at the end of it makes it all worthwhile and makes it worth doing again and again and again in light of eternity and not just our eternity, but the eternity of our households and the generations to come and their households. As a chosen daughter of the King, remember that the choices you make today will determine what your life looks like and your generation to come life looks like. One of the things I love about Joshua is that he knew the people that he was leading were prone to forget. So quite a few times throughout this book, when something big happened, in order to help the people remember, he got them to set up stones of remembrance. As they passed by them, they'd be reminded and tell others of what God had done and help them stay focused on what they were doing and what they were building. I would love to leave you with an activation today for you to set something up in your life as a remembrance stone or a way to remember what God has spoken to you over this conference time. A reminder that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord a reminder of the faithfulness of God, a reminder of the fact that you are chosen and a reminder of the impact of the choices that you make. It could be a key ring, it could be something you write down and put up in your room, something that every day reminds you of what God has done to help you keep your eyes fixed on the prize, to help you keep your eyes fixed on the why, the why I'm making this choice and the why this is a right choice. Um, let me pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you that these incredible people went before us and we get to read their stories and glean so much for them, from them. Lord, would you just change our hearts today? Help us to set things, to remember the why of the choices that we're making, to remember that we are a chosen people that have a choice to make to follow you every day. Thank you, Jesus, that we don't have to do this on our own. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that fills us and guides us and comforts us in the storms. Thank you for community and those you put around us to encourage us. Would you help us to keep our eyes fixed on you? Help us to remember what and who we are doing this for. Jesus, would you be more real to us after this time together than you have ever been before? Thank you for who you are. And thank you for the privilege of being able to share with these incredible women today. Would you bless each one of them? Would they know you more and more and would they know that they are chosen? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Thank you guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the honor of letting me share with you today and be blessed. Have an amazing time together.